video. Um, it is primarily being made for educational purposes. I want to apply uh, the rhetorical concepts of genre and exigency um, and uh, some of those other uh, rhetorical aspects of writing to um, a current event, uh, partially because I think it's one of the big reasons we do this. Um, again, for educational purposes, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try to just walk through the analysis um, an application to, of, uh, of genre and exigency to the First Amendment and, um, and apply it to what sometimes can happen in uh, protest movements or riots and just talk definitions. Uh, currently, the uh, thing th that makes this applicable is um, uh, a sad occurrence with George Floyd, I believe, um, in Minneapolis. Uh, and so we'll briefly touch on it's that's the exigency so let's talk this through um, the rhetorical concept of exigency as I've said in another video is um, why a writer writes right now why would you do why would you respond to something what's the triggering event um, and when I when I say triggering event sometimes people think of triggers that are like emotional triggers that's not exactly the same thing though it could be sometimes when people go off on rants it's because they've been triggered by something and they don't have the self-control to think about Kairos which is that other exigency piece which is the timely moment so you may be the trigger may be someone said something and it wasn't right what they said and you can either choose to let your emotions control you or you can uh, find a rhetorically appropriate time and place and way to respond and so that's why I care about this and what and why I want to apply it here so um, because there are sometimes when if we let our emotions go right away um, it, it can end badly um, those those end up leading to things like crimes of passion or whatnot um, potentially but when we talk about um, exigency in this case summer 2020 uh, right after COVID and kind of in the middle of it still technically um, we are seeing a uh, another surge in um, in the media of things connected to um, tensions between uh, uh, racial tension um, ex specifically w in connection to police brutality um, so uh, you can go Google the George Floyd situation let's just talk through this though and I can do more on the First Amendment and probably will at some point in time I just don't know if I'm fully ready to do the whole thing but let's just talk about it um, one thing we have um, as a genre in this country, political form of writing. Um, so genre, again, is any type or form of communication with socially agreed upon norms or conventions. Um, so we have an exigency, this, uh, this, these sad happenings uh, that appear to be um, from all, for all, uh, that appear as much as I can tell to be racially motivated um, or uh, at least racially oriented enough to cause tension. Um, I'm assuming it's a, a, a hate crime. But uh, I'll let the court of law decide that. Um, it f looks that way from the outside, from states and states away, as someone who studies rhetoric and all that fun stuff. So, um, but that's the exigency. This thing happened, and it's sad, and it, it really sad. Um, so let's talk through it um, as it applies. So exigency, a thing that causes a need for us to respond. Um, there's something that we feel like was morally or ethically violated in a particular act. Um, and so when we go to do that in this country, we ha when we go to respond, there are certain ways we can respond, that we're legally allowed to respond. Um, we have certain genres of communication that guide that politically. And so uh, political genres we find are the um, you know, amendments to the Constitution, uh, federal, state, and local laws. Those are all types of writing. There are specific ways those are phrased. There are specific ways that they're created. Um, they're, you know, they're built into either a, con a, a, a national, state, or local constitution of some kind. Um, there are people who create them, specific people who are supposed to be creating them and voting on them and, and haggling over what they mean. Well, um, the one that is most applicable to the, uh, to this, uh, to dealing or responding to hate crimes that are done on uh, on the scale that we're seeing it um, lead, tie us back to the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging or shortening or limiting the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. 
that's it. Now there are other, there's case law also that we might draw from the uh, judicial branch of government and we could talk about those as genres, but we're not gonna right now. I might ask my students to do some of that at some point in time. Um, so the First Amendment lays out some things. There's, uh, it, the, when it comes to this, let's talk freedom of speech um, and right to peaceably assemble. Freedom of speech has been, um, has certain parameters around it. Um, and part of that is that peaceable assembly part uh, built in. So um, that establishes the genre of um, what we, how we might respond. It establishes parameters, social constraints, politically um, developed social constraints on how someone can respond even to things that hit them very, very uh, strongly and emotionally. Um, so we wanna keep that in mind. We're allowed to talk, and there are, but there are parameters and limitations. Peaceable assembly. So we have this thing called peaceable assembly. Um, and so that assemble just means gather together. Sometimes uh, that uh, piece of, that right to peaceably assemble could be seen as like a macro genre. They're all, or that an assembly is a macro genre. There are all different ways that people could gather together and talk. Um, sometimes subgenres might be called protests. And so now we're looking at this secondary genre within assembly that says uh, protest is a statement or action expressing disapproval or objection to something. A written declar declaration typically by a notary public that a bill has been presented and payment or acceptance refused. Protest. Um, so that's more of a legal law version. Or express, expressing an objection to what someone has said or done. Um, and so a lot of times we will see large movements and we've seen um, them throughout the throughout history um, and in the United States because we have the right to peaceably assemble. We see it um, more regularly um, hopefully, uh, in meaningful ways. Um, there, there have been uh, Black Lives Matter protests, Blue Lives Matter protests. Um, there were protests um, back in 2016 after, uh, or early 2017, after President Trump um, was inaugurated. Um, those are things. Um, so those protests, as long as they're peaceable, are allowed. They're, they're within the legal rights of every citizen to do that. Um, and, uh, and so, for instance, if we see people on a newscast calling people who protest thugs, that's not really um, within the parameter of the protest. Um, often, though, uh, what happens, or not often, sometimes what happens in a protest is it shifts genres, the communication shifts, and it's no longer just someone expressing their um, sadness or expressing a message or declaring their disapproval. It can sometimes shift um, to another genre, um, and in small scale, and uh, small scale or large scale, in small pockets or large uh, or large scale, um, and that is where it goes, and it shifts genre from a protest form of communication to a riot uh, genre, and so that's where there is now suddenly a violent disturbance of peace by a crowd, um, an impressive, an impressively large or very dis of something uh, or taking part in violent public disturbance again so you can kind of see the texture here um, and so we want to be careful um, if we are talking about people speaking out against something we don't mislabel the genre inappropriately um, if someone is protesting they have the right to protest um, when it no longer is peaceable um, when it, there are when it becomes a when any sort of violence shifts that or any sort of aggression um, beyond just speech um, shifts that uh, it becomes a disturbance of the peace by a crowd. There are even parameters within uh, public speech that would pro that some people might consider a protest that would be inciting um, aggression in the people around them, and so even that doesn't fall under that freedom of speech. So we want to think about how how we respond to exigencies like um, especially when it's this large scale thing and we want to think about um, how we can respond in a way that's rhetorically effective and healthy and helpful to the situation. Um, protests are perfectly legal and acceptable. Um, they become riots sometimes when um, when people get either uh, they let their they lose self control and part of rhetoric is about self control. Um, it doesn't mean there's no emotion. It means allowing your emotion out in strategic moments and allowing the, it out in a controlled way. That's one of the reasons why there is such thing as a writing process. It's that um, we need to think about our words before we speak. Um, there's a old saying that says, "Be slow to uh, slow to 
uh, speak, slow to anger. Um, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Um, that doesn't mean being angry is wrong, but how we express those emotions uh, is really important. And it, and it can sometimes make the difference between um, a peaceful assembly and a violent disturbance of uh, a, a, or a riot. And so those two genres we want to think about. And we, at, even as we consider what our rights are in, our, in the U.S., in uh, the country that I live in, or if you're in another country, protest may mean something slightly different. That rhetorical situation and rhetorical context are going to shift things. Um, however you feel about the current events, the way you express yourself regarding them should be controlled. Even if there's emotion, it should be strategically released. Um, because otherwise, uh, you risk going against an ancient proverb that says, don't go quickly with a crowd. Um, it ends in violence. And so um, we have to be careful how we approach a situation. We want to be rhetorically savvy in the way we communicate, especially when, particularly when, our emotions are high. And they can be, are, it's okay for you to have emotions and to have them be, and for you to be amped up and uh, stressed out. Those things are okay as long as you have those emotions within control and you have and you create a plan for releasing them effectively um, or dealing with them effectively um, or meaningfully or in a healthy way. Um, so that can be the difference. Um, Self-control and uh, of the individual and self-governance of the individual is one of the key premises in anything that links to democratic government. Um, that's one of the reasons why freedom of speech is a thing. Um, it is based on the assumption that um, the individual in con will be responsible for themselves and their actions and their words and the impact of those words and actions. Um, and so uh, we want to be aware of that if we're trying to be better communicators and be more successful at getting the message out that we want to get out to the people we want to get it to, we, um, we want to be really strategic in how we do that. Um, when we shift from a protest, which is a very strategic form of communication, um, and, it, and into a riot, there is usually a loss of control and a heightening of emotion. And when people, um, psychology will tell, sociology will tell us all about what happens when heightened emotion gets combined with um, large groups of people and what it does to group think and the way they approach problems and challenges. Um, and so uh, whatever the case, be careful that as you speak about things that happen in social media or as you protest, that you do it in a way that effectively expresses the emotions and concerns you have um, in a way that um, if nothing else respects and honors people who are listening and around you, um, you want to be aware. Be careful. So, um, however you respond, even if you, whether, whatever side of the spectrum, political, whatever part of the political spectrum you're on on any issue, um, give honor to all people and uh, even when they don't, that's a rhetorical strategy. Um, use self-control even when others don't that's a rhetorical strategy, um, and it is a way to build credibility with your audience. Um, often, people who are out of control lose all credibility. And even if a and if you are part of a large group situation, take responsibility for the people around you and um, and working with them to help them stay in control of their emotions, so that the overall um, image of the protest or the uh, public speech or whatever it is take responsibility for the people around you at least um, and maintaining that kind of control. If you are a leader of a major movement that it's going to be even more important uh, to be careful how you speak because there is that fine line between expressing rhetorically effective expression of emotion and outrage um, and anger um, and then in pushing beyond that into inciting the passions of other people um, in a way that becomes unhealthy to them or to the uh, people around them. So we want to think about this in terms of genre, in terms of exigency, why I would write right now, um, in terms of genre, how I structure my communication, um, what rhetorical strategies am I going to use, um, which ones are going to be effective, which ones are going to be helpful, um, which ones are going to accomplish the purpose that I have.
Now, technically, if your purpose, there, there may be people whose purpose is to take a protest and turn it into a riot. And they may be rhetorically effective in, in their, from their own position of um, they're angry and they want violence. And so they may be saying things on purpose without uh, maybe even considering the possibility of um, those violent implications and intentionally trying to incite a riot or intentionally adding um, the uh, violence as a rhetorical strategy in their mind to their message. Um, and that's one of those ba back and forths. In their mind, they're going to be rhetorically effective because they've accomplished their purpose. That was one of the back and forths with protest movements uh, between Malcolm X and uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, they went back and forth about what is peaceful protest versus um, other ways of, uh, of dealing with strong problems. And so you want to be aware. You want to be strategic. You want to be self-controlled and careful. Um, and think about not just how you are feeling, but how the way you express your feelings and, um, and your grievances will translate to the people around you. And what the possible repercussions of how you speak, not what you speak, not the message, but how you frame the message. Um, how that might cause, how might that, how that may cause you to shift genres. Um, so hopefully this makes sense as far as an application of exigency and genre um, to first the First Amendment, the difference between a protest and a riot, and all that fun stuff. Uh, it's a little heavier thing. Um, I usually try to keep my own opinions out of political events and just talk about strategies and hope that everyone else will be uh, taking these strategies and using them in an ethical way. Uh, but if you have any questions about this or my position on this, feel free to comment on YouTube or if you're one of my students, send me a text and we can talk through it. Uh, any, anything like that, I'll talk through. Um, so keep chugging, hang in there.